Welcome to the launch of Nash Squared's Digital Leadership Report 2022. We were supposed to be in Antwerp today, but unfortunately both for ourselves and our Belgium colleagues, we've not been able to do that due to a national strike. Instead, you're joining us from a pop-up studio here in the heart of the English countryside. The report details the disruption that's been wrought on our industry, and perhaps today's event is further evidence of that. So, join us this afternoon for the launch of the longest and largest running digital leadership report. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Over 900 of you have across 50 different countries and hopefully many more on LinkedIn Live. So whether you're waking up and you're on the west coast of the USA and this is your morning watch over breakfast or perhaps this is your evening entertainment if you're in Asia, thanks for spending some time with us. We are going to go through the survey results in some detail shortly and then follow that with a panel discussion. But first of all, it's my absolute pleasure to be joined by Bev White, our group CEO. How does it feel to launch the 24th edition of the survey? Well, Dave, thank, thank you. I think it's incredible actually to think it's been running so long um, and there's been so much change over that time. But before I go any further, I want to say a massive thank you to all of you for taking the time to complete this survey. It gives us such rich data and we really value it, as I hope you do too. Um, but yeah, since I was the CIO, so much has changed. Technology is really moving at a pace. Obviously, you mentioned there that it's moving at a pace, but what has stood out to you this year? Mm, hard to choose, right? Nonetheless, I will. So let's pick two. I'm going to say disruption and change. And as you'd mentioned on, on the video just a moment ago, actually, uh, we were due to be in Antwerp today, uh, live from a studio there. And in fact, we're in the heart of the English countryside now, showing that we can be very agile uh, when needs must. Your political forces are always throwing challenges to technology leaders. And here we are with a new pop-up studio. It really does show how technology organisations can adapt, right? It, it really does. Absolutely, that's true. And I think technological change is, is really moving. So we are only just beginning to see the full force of what AI and robotics, machine learning, can really bring to businesses and how it can adapt and change. I really can't wait to hear from our panellists today. Before we get to that, we do have the main event. and We'll hand over now to the survey results. Welcome everyone to the 2022 launch of the Nash Square Digital Leadership Report in collaboration with CIO Net. Now in our 24th year, the report has grown to be one of the most influential global studies on the role of the digital leader and everything that goes with it. And on the subject of digital leaders, thank you so much to every one of you who took part. We know it's quite a detailed survey that takes some time to complete, but the feedback we get is that you value the depth and insights that it gives. Now last year, we reported how we were beginning to emerge from the pandemic. Some may have even predicted that by now, everything would be back to normal. But that wasn't to be, was it, Luke? No, Lily. 2022 has brought more change and disruption than any of us were expecting. And this year's report has shed some light on it. Through this research, we've asked deep questions about how organizations are responding and how digital leaders are evolving. Here we've picked the eight key insights. One theme that emerges strongly from this year's research is change and disruption. Almost nine in 10 digital leaders believe that major global change is happening faster than ever. Where once disruption might have been a term reserved for new entrants in the market or a competitor's new products, it now comes from all directions, including geopolitics, supply chains, and the great resignation. As the world grows more interconnected, issues in one region have direct implications for other geographies. One example of this is that more than a quarter of our respondents across the globe are rethinking their technology strategy simply as a result of the war in Ukraine. Many respondents have also stated how very tactical factors like silicon chip availability have become more strategically important. Unpredictability has become the norm and digital leaders will need to plan for it as best they can. Lily, it's no secret that digital leaders have lowered expectations for growth in the future. A slowdown in technology spending mixed with unpredictable employment trends will make it difficult to navigate planning and budgeting for everyone in 2023. 
That said, despite less positive economic outlook, at least half of the digital leaders remain optimistic about increasing their technology spend in the face of economic pressures. The third highest reading in the 17 years we've been measuring it. When it comes to the economy, technology has a role to play, both when the sun shines and when the clouds gather. Now there is no let up in the war for talent. 70% of this year's digital leaders state that a skills shortage prevents them from keeping up with the pace of change. Now that's the highest we've seen since we started reporting 24 years ago. 60% feel that the rising cost of living has made salary demands unsustainable. Now businesses run on people, but the technology sector simply can't find enough of them. While the skills shortages afflicting the sector are nothing new, it's a concern that they're worsening rather than getting better. However, what we see in our research is that organisations are taking innovative steps to ease the challenges. For instance, many are redesigning their employee offers to attract more talent with things like unlimited holiday policies. And over a quarter are looking beyond their own borders to access international candidates to work for them remotely. The market for talent is now global. Despite growth in tech budgets, the investment focus has changed. Tech spending on cloud remains strong, but it has slowed in emerging technologies like AI, automation and big data. This is threatening opportunities to innovate during this period of global economic instability. Almost two-thirds of digital leaders think that big data and analytics will be in the top two technologies to deliver competitive advantage in the next years. Only a fifth feel that they are effective at using data insights to generate more revenue. Both figures are down compared to last year's report, suggesting that big data is only getting bigger in all senses of the word, including its complexity. Another challenge is getting the right skills, with 43% of digital leaders hampered by a skill shortage in this area. Last year, we saw cybercrime level out a little, and some wondered whether maybe, just maybe, digital leaders were beginning to get it under control. Unfortunately, this year we report that managing cybersecurity has never been more challenging. Increased use of cloud and global unrest has led to 40% of our respondents fearing an attack from foreign powers, and over, that's over three times what it was in 2018. Overall, major cyber attacks have jumped by almost a fifth in the last 12 months, and only around a third of organisations consider themselves very well positioned to deal with the challenge. According to our data, the largest organisations are the most at risk from attack. Now, there are three possible responses to dealing with cybersecurity attacks. Accept, remedy or move the risk elsewhere. It would appear that many digital leaders are choosing the last response and moving operations to an external provider. But regardless of who runs the technology, the risk still remains. 41% of our respondents state that cloud has only complicated cybersecurity for their business. It is no surprise that our research shows that remote and hybrid working models rapidly deployed during the pandemic are here to stay, as workers value flexibility and organizations benefit from a wider access to talent. Almost a third expect staff to work in the office one day a week or less. Fewer than one in 10 expect them in every day. Being office-based for around two to three days is the typical requirement. During the depth of the pandemic, remote working was a technology that kept many organizations alive. But is the honeymoon period over? The research shows that what is good about remote working, for instance, productivity, is less good this year. And what is bad about it, for instance, mental health, is getting even worse. So many organizations are thinking very carefully about how they support their employees as they move into a hybrid working model. I've been presenting this survey for nearly eight years now and the outlook for gender diversity has often been disappointing to say the least. So I'm pleased to finally be able to report some positive news here. Almost a quarter of the tech team is now female and the pipeline is improving with 28% of new hires being female too. Female digital leader respondents to our survey are now at the highest level they have ever been at 14%. We should pause to celebrate this. It's taken a very long time to come, 
but I hope you'll all agree with me that 14% is still not close to being good enough. And the pace of change is slow. At the current rate, gender participation will reach 50-50 by 2060. Many of us may not live to see it. And taking diversity in a wider sense, although some ethnic minorities are relatively well represented in tech, the higher you go up the career ladder, the less diverse it becomes. We've had years of diversity initiatives, quotas and positive action, but not always a lot to show for it. I cannot think of a better career for someone to go into than tech. It's creative, it's well paid, and you have the potential to change the world. We need to get the word out so that everyone is included. It's never been easy being a digital leader, but as organizations become even more reliant on technology, the consequence of choices made or not made significantly grows. The challenge for many digital leaders is to balance what's urgent and what's important. And for many, dealing with cloud, cyber and resourcing is another job to be getting on with. But what this research shows and has shown over its many years of running is that the really successful digital leaders look beyond what's immediately in front of them. While cloud will keep your life today, it's data, innovation and diversity that will help you flourish in the future. It's no small task, but successful di digital leaders didn't become leaders because it was easy. It was because they wanted to make a difference. And in today's technology-driven world, the opportunities to do just that are everywhere. We do have our panel to go over those results in a bit more detail, picking up on points around investment, security and inclusion. Our panel, hopefully, is able to join me now. We've got five speakers from across the world. And starting with Alexander, you're in Kyiv. It would be great if you could just quickly tell us who you are and what you do in the next 30 seconds or so. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexander Kosovan. I'm the CEO and founder of MacPo, a software development company based in Ukraine. Uh, we develop uh, system utilities basically for Mac uh, and Apple ecosystem, um, both system utilities and security products for end customers like uh, probably you, everyone. And beside that, I'm also a founder of a, a private uh, VC fund called SMRK, and we invest in different startups, uh, both in Ukraine and abroad. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, and then hopefully from Ukraine, we can jump across to Belgium, where obviously we hope to be this afternoon. Uh, Devi, would you uh, like to introduce yourselves to our audience? Yes, uh, thank you so much for having me here. I'm uh, Devi van de Vever. I'm the founder of Flowpilots. Flowpilots is a service tech company, so we build actually mobile and uh, technological solutions for our customers. And besides that, I um, am also uh, yeah, like keynote speaker on everything that has to do with more women in tech and also with regards to uh, more sustainable and ethical um, technologies and um, business models for our companies. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. A little bit closer to home, we have Joe Drake. Good afternoon, all. My name is Joe Drake. I'm Group CIO at THG, formerly known as the Hub Group. Uh, we are a global technology business. We specialize predominantly in e-commerce um, for our own brands and for the brands of some of our global clients. Uh, we also do logistics, uh, creative manufacturing, and we own a number of hotels, gyms, spas, and event space too. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, if we jump across to the United States, where of course it's early morning, say good morning to Serena. Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Dr. Serena Huang, and I am a thought leader and practitioner in people analytics, HR technology, and ethical AI. I'm also a LinkedIn learning instructor as of recently um, on my newest course called the Data Science of Using People Analytics. I have a gift for you today. It is free until the end of this month. So do check it out if you want to learn how to retain and hire better using data analytics. It's a data science of using people analytics 
I am also uh, the head of people analytics HR tech at PayPal. So nice meeting you all. Thank you. And then last but by no means least, back across to Belgium, uh, Tom, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm Tom Wouters. I'm uh, the Chief Products Officer for um, SDWorks. SDWorks is a leading HR and payroll services provider company in Europe. And uh, my responsibility is uh, to, uh, yeah, to build, to manage, and to maintain all technological products uh, in the portfolio of SDWorks. So, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, look, we've got some questions here that we've prepared based on the results from the survey, of course, the results that so many of you have contributed to. We're not looking for questions from the audience, but it would be great to have some comments on the debate itself with our five leaders. So if you've got those uh, that you'd like to make as we go through the debate, it'd be great. And, and some of those will be filtered through to me as we speak. So it'd be great to involve you in the discussion. But we'll start by uh, going back to you, Tom, with this first question. The report talks about the gem of the digital economy being data, yet spend on AI and automation has dipped. Has that gem lost its shine? Um, and what place, pl pressure is being placed on you to reduce investment? Well, um, it's not a, I, th I don't think the gem has, uh, has lost its, its shine. It's, it's only about, um, it's a means to an end. And, um, what is important that um, it needs to serve our priorities and priorities, um, at least for the works are still uh, top of the list is uh, customer centricity. So um, if that AI or data wouldn't feed into our customer centricity projects or priorities, then uh, there is for sure a lot of pressure on me to not invest in it anymore. Now, that's uh, happily not the case. Huh? So uh, data, data and insights, just like Serena was, was, was telling us, is is uh, on the top of the list for a lot of HR professionals to get to get more uh, to get more on uh, on that. So happily, we are not reducing that uh, uh, that investment on data. Um, a bit on AI because uh, on AI it's not that easy to find a, a good use case to serve into that customer centricity. But certainly for data, there is a lot of use cases uh, for HR professionals to build extra value on. So uh, at least for as it works, there is no no. no uh, very hard pressure on that investment. I guess there, if you're talking about data and HR professionals, it would be brilliant to get the views of Serena and see whether that, that tallies from your, your global perspective in, in PayPal. And listening to Tom there, I, I suppose that certainly does probably ring bells with what, what you're seeing. Yeah, definitely. No, I think the pandemic and then this great resonation that followed the pandemic has put a lot of attention on how we can attract and retain talent better. Um, so definitely seeing a lot of investment and effort there in that space that I haven't seen before. Um, you know, when I first started in people analytics, we were doing really basic reporting. It was Excel spreadsheets. And now we are running machine learning model predicting who is going to leave, similar to a customer churn model years ago. Um, so I definitely see the advancement in using data analytics to attract and retain talent uh, and look forward to continue to see that investment grow. I do think that we are starting to find it difficult, um, certainly in niche fields where uh, talent is very scarce, right? And so we're thinking about how we can actually upskill or reskill employees internally and create internal mobility to help retain talent because it is much easier to keep them than to go out and find them. With regards to this, it would be interesting to know where your priorities are. Um, Devi, let, let's come to you. Tom talks very much about the priority being around customer cent centricity. Um, what, what do you think the priorities are for the industry at the moment? Um, yeah, it's actually the, the, the irony is that with technology, when I hear Tom said, less, yes, it's still uh, difficult to find the right use cases with, with AI. And I think with all new emerging technologies, you have that um, feeling like you have to do something with it, but it's still difficult to find the right uh, applicative uh, 
means. And so I think the industry, especially now with uh, with yeah this recession coming up, has come to this conclusion that of course, like all these projects are very interesting, but you have to look into why you are actually implementing them. And what I think that industry should be focusing on is again, like rethinking strategy, like what is the purpose of your company? Where are you going for in the next uh, couple of years? And how will technology help you in that? And then on the basis of that strategy, choose the technologies that you need and make sure that you have those uh, steps ready. And then you also know like uh, what, how many people that you need in staff, then you also know what kind of profiles that you uh, can search for. And you can also start to prepare as a company to um, educate your people, like uh, Serena said, inside your company to, for those jobs that will come in the, in the future. And I, uh, I still find it um, amazing that a lot of companies sometimes still like uh, how I say implement projects for the for the, for technology first kind of thinking instead of actually strategy uh, first thinking. Only last night, Nash Squared were uh, fortunate to host a number of politicians and of uh, some of our clients at the Houses of Parliament. And interesting that you were talking there about strategy, Debbie, because th there was very much a slant there that we have to be progressive with innovation. We have to make sure that companies. Uh, stay on, on the front foot. Looking at the survey uh, and the results, innovation is secondary to operational IT. Alexander, it'd be great to come to you. Isn't innovation the focus that we need to stay on that front foot? Isn't innovation what is going to drive us through, through recovery? Uh, well, and definitely without innovations, uh, we wouldn't be probably here. Uh, I think uh, all of the crises are uh, sparking some uh, innovations. And uh, even uh, though big companies may uh, may lose some customers or may reorient uh, their businesses, there are a lot of uh, new uh, companies that are arising every day in the times of crisis. crisis. Even our company was started in 2008. Uh, just at the beginning of the global crisis and uh, here we are today we are, we are still innovating and hoping for the uh, bright future so yeah I think without innovations uh, it's not impossible to imagine it's impossible to imagine the technological future how just to stick with you how easy is it to innovate in times of crisis uh, well, you don't have a choice, I would say so. Uh, when crisis happens, uh, uh, you you lose money, you lose sometimes uh, the previous uh, tools that were um, available to you and you have to adapt uh, to survive. And ac actually, I would say that it is much easier to innovate because you have some external factors uh, that are uh, forcing you to do so. Joe, I mean, from, from the British perspective, as I said, we, we, last night we were in, in Parliament. Interesting that Alexander said there, you know, you, you have to, to adapt. Um, it can't just be about protecting revenues right now. And I understand that that's kind of the default setting for business. But as a technology leader of, of THG and as someone who's recently been voted the number one CIO in the UK, I mean, what, what do you see as the role of the, the CIO community in driving innovation? I think, it, uh, firstly, I think there's a bit of a misconception about operations isn't a place where you can be innovative as well. I think there's sure. huge amounts of opportunity to be very innovative with, with your operations because we certainly, we need to focus on the strategy of the business and where we can bring the biggest big business value, which means our resources need to be focused on the things that will make our business successful. Um, and that often means being innovative with operations, you know, we are, we've been investing heavily in RPA and automating the crap out of everything and trying to reduce our operational toil as much as possible. That gives us better data as well, which means we can use that data to drive further improvements. And with that, we've been, there's been, we've already touched upon the fact that organizations have been reskilling resources. And for me, that's not just within the tech team. I've been finding resource internally in the business as well. You know, I'll sneak around the warehouses, the factories, anywhere where I can find somebody who's got a passion for tech. That's invaluable. We can bring them over into tech and, and cross-train them and upskill them. 
And we've also seen a huge change with upskilling internal resources that were very in very heavy operational roles that are almost now acting as consultants either into our own business to help them, other areas of business, remove their operational toil, um, but also being able to drive more revenue into the business by um, selling services that bring more revenue in. So it's all about driving value for the business that you're in. I think, I think it was Debbie that, that touched on that a moment ago. That's absolutely key. I, I know I said that we weren't going to take questions uh, from the audience, and I'm now going to throw one in. So I'm, I'm sorry to go back on something that I said, but we've had a comment that came in to say, how are the business ambitions for agile transformational change balanced by IT department capability and capacity constraints? I would think listening to what you were talking there, there, there might be a view there, uh, Joe. David, sorry, could you repeat sure, the question? Sure, of course. How are the business ambitions for agile transformational change balanced by IT department capacity and capability constraints? I think this goes back to the comment I made a moment ago about you want your resources to be focused on bringing the most value to the business. So there are a million things we would like to do. We could be really, really busy doing those million things and those million things would not result in value for the business. So I think it's really, really important that you understand what value to the business means and then you focus your resources on the right area um, and think about what skills you need to deploy to, to realize those opportunities as well. So as far as capacity and capability goes, if you can just be making sure your resources are focused on the right, the right thing to bring success for the business, um, and then you constantly need to be looking at what skills, experience, and things you need to put in place for those teams to be to be successful. But it's it's a constant. It's, it's a constant juggling act to make that that's my job my job is to make my team successful and they're successful when they deliver value for the business and that's 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 pretty much a full-time job in uh, liaising with all your various stakeholders and um, translating that into where the biggest value can be delivered from your teams and then setting them up for success in delivering that one of the big themes in the report is around cybersecurity. Uh, so, Alexander, I'll, I'll come to you for this particular question initially, but it'd be very interesting to see what everyone's views are. So, global unrest um, in, in cyber attacks has increased by a fifth. Um, sorry, or that cyber attacks, rather, have increased by a fifth. And only a third of organisations feel that they are well equipped to deal with that challenge. Originally, I'd said, rather negatively, I'd framed this question as, you know, what can we do? We appear to be losing the war on cyber. I suppose I'll reframe it and ask, how can we win the war on cyber, given the concern of so many organizations? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think uh, that uh, cyber security importance uh, is uh, uh, much, much more critical than we thought before, uh, because uh, lately we see that cyber uh, attacks are not just random events by some random groups. Uh, the cyber uh, attacks are becoming a cyber weapon for some countries. Like, for example, in 2000, uh, 2017, uh, Russia has launched the most destructive cyber attack in history, uh, which was called NotPetya attack. Uh, it's, it was a ransomware widely uh, distributed by the Ru Russian military uh, that was targeting Ukraine's government, financial and energy institutions, as, many, as well as many uh, uh, international companies' offices in, in Ukraine. Uh, so in one day, uh, a lot of companies were affected and um, the economy uh, felt this destructive uh, cyber attacks very significantly. So uh, this is just one of uh, the examples how how much worse the uh, security attacks can be nowadays. And I think it is really important for uh, all of, uh, organizations 
organizations to take it really seriously. And it's not just a, in a responsibility of one uh, cyber uh, department or one uh, you know, office IT department. It, it is responsibility for almost every employee because uh, uh, the weakest point in the chain is, uh, is, is one person. So even an average employee with access to some internal information to uh, access with some client information uh, could uh, have a serious effect on your business and, uh, and, and your company. So it is really critical. It'd be interesting to see what the, uh, the response of the rest of the panel is. Obviously, throwing that to Alexander, um, yeah, Tom, we'll, we'll come to you. Throwing that to Alexander seems a, a little bit obvious given the situation with Ukraine at the moment. But Tom, uh, how, how are you currently responding to that environment? Yeah, I th uh, just want to respond to, to Alexander's sure. um, point of view. I, th I think it is indeed a question of investment in technology, um, a portion of it, uh, to prevent these attacks or to log them or to, uh, to respond to them. But um, I think the more important thing is to create awareness amongst our, our key users and our, and, our, and our own employees, because that is, the, uh, as Alexander stated, it, it's, it's the weakest point. Uh, for all our uh, our companies, uh, where um, if the awareness of these uh, of these cyber attacks is not high enough, and yeah, just like a lot of you guys, but also we, are uh, are dealing with a lot of uh, delicate data of our customers, payroll data in this case. Um, so um, we are also subject to these attacks uh, in a lot of these cases, and um, yeah, the most of the uh, data privacy problems that we that we could have is uh, with our own employees not being aware of these attacks. So um, I think uh, our investments, as we are doing right now, is in, in uh, increasing that awareness and the way to deal with it uh, with our own employees, is, I think is still the best investments that we can do. It's interesting there that you talk about employees. Again, if I hop back to last night, we had someone describing a situation where they um, actively lock their iPhone in a box when they uh, are in a meeting for fear of some of that data perhaps uh, being, being taken. What works when educating people? Uh, it'd be interesting. Perhaps, Joe, come to you first of all. You've got a, a large internal population uh, of users. How best do we educate people, to Tom's point, to make sure that phishing attacks, which we've seen on the rise, obviously, are, are less problematic for organizations? I mean, I think I bet a lot of organizations do similar stuff to, to what we do. You know, we do lots of... Uh, online training we talk about uh this stuff a lot we educate people a lot we test people a lot we do a lot of internal um phishing attacks on our staff to make sure uh that, that they're responding in in the right way um so yeah it's really just education education talking testing um all of that sort of thing really anything that any of our panel would point to that has particularly worked uh with their employees um Looking around now, anyone, anyone going to step forward with a suggestion of, 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 of kind of a route to educating? No, everyone's shy. I, okay. I can, share, okay. yeah, I can sure. share a little bit. Um, you know, certainly we do very similar, similar tactics, right? Educating employees and, and practice uh, to see if anyone uh, gets tricked. But I think there's broader application as you think about training now that many companies are still either hybrid or completely remote. How do we deliver training when it comes to whether it's cybersecurity or some other topics effectively? That's very much on my mind and I know on many leaders' minds as well. Something that um, we have seen effective is making the training shorter so that it's more bite-sized chunks. No one wants to sit through, trust me, a 90-minute video training of any sort. And if you can make it fun and competitive, the better. So whether it's you know setting up competitive games to see who is able to finish faster, which team completes faster within the organization, and have a scoreboard you know, showing, that could be really fun and get, in, get more em employees to engage. Um, so make it short, make it fun to the extent that you can, and that will make sure people are more willing to participate, especially something that appears to be less interesting of a training. Thank you. We've got comments and questions coming in. I promise that I will try and weave them into the discussion when it feels appropriate. Um, I will stick with you, Serena, though, for this next point. Six in 10 
According to the survey, feel that rising costs have made salary demands unsustainable and that change is so fast and overwhelming that a majority feel unable to keep pace. Um, those are the highest levels, incidentally, since we started uh, this, in, in, formerly the CIO survey and now the Digital Leadership Report, uh, obviously over 24 years. Um, how are you managing the mental and physical impacts this environment that we're all facing is having on your people? Yeah, definitely. I think there are maybe two points, right? One on the salary increases and inflation that we are all facing is certainly causing a lot of stress on all the businesses. Uh, one thing that um, you might want to think about doing is look at some of the roles that you have backfilled with either internal talent or external talent. A lot of times what we found is when you go externally, that job becomes really expensive. And not because external talent always costs more than internal talent, but because of some of the rescoping that naturally happens when you're posting a job externally. So my recommendation you know, to deal with the increasing salary pressure and inflation is create a strategy where you can go internal first when you have vacancies. How do you find the talent you need? Do you know the hidden talent and skills that your employees have? That's also a data that a lot of companies don't have. So uh, again, think about a really simple question. If I ask you right now, how many of your employees know Python really well in your company? I bet very few companies can answer that with accuracy. Why is that? Because we don't have data on employee skills. So skills going forward, if you're able to fill roles by matching people with the skill sets that they can provide, then you can potentially create this internal market space instead of having to go externally, which is usually more slowly and more expensive. Um, so that's point number one. As far as the mental and physical toll, that has been really challenging. Um, I'll share some of my personal practices that I have found helpful. Um, I, I have something called the Serena Index on my team now, where at the beginning of the week, we start the week by you know doing planning, what we're going to do as a team. And then I ask everyone on the team, how are you feeling on a scale one to 10? Really simple. And we're all data nerds. So, you know, of course we have a dashboard, we have trending. And then on Friday, we ask again, how are you feeling now as we close the week? So we check in on employees who have seen a decrease, you know, over a course of five days. We also check in on employees who are a bit lower. And then we check in, you know, have people who have higher scores share, why are you feeling so great? And, and again, that's a really simple way where you're you know, gathering a little bit of signal slash data, um, but also practically speaking, you can check in on people. Something that we also know from the pandemic is you know, work and life, um, personal life, that line has blurred. So sometimes people are stressed because of personal situations. And through those conversations, I was always able to hear from my employees on other things that's not work-related, uh, if they're willing to share, that we can all help them with. Lovely to hear your comments. Uh, Devi, it'd be interesting to kind of hear what your response would be to some of that. Um, there we're hearing about go internal, use data, um, we often talk about innovation. It'd be interesting to know if there are any innovations that you think can help this epidemic around mental health. But at the same time, Serena there is talking about something as simple as checking in, uh, which feels very uh, analog and old school. What, what do you think is working? Is it, is it about innovations? Is it a, a bit of a blend of these different approaches? Um, I think uh, we're still all humans <laughs> and humans like attention and your empl employees just want you to, uh, they want to be seen. And I think sometimes that's something we forget with all this technology and talking about uh, the metaverse and VR and that we can connect like that and all these chat rooms and Slack, that in the end, um, yeah, people just want to be, be known and seen and also be appreciated. And uh, I think that is for uh, especially leaders of companies and, and uh, managers. One of the, the most uh, important jobs at this moment is to make sure that uh, they're, they're uh, per, the people that are in their team uh, know that they're um, that the, the ones that are there eh, plus one know that they're there that they know what they can what their skill set is and that they are uh, also um, asked for um, putting their in, their their knowledge into the the company and to um, 
to collaborate with each other. And so I think that, um, of course, um, tools and, and can help. In Belgium, we have an awesome startup, which is called uh, Bloom Up. Uh, it's especially for, for tracking mental health. And I, I do believe that some people uh, uh, have benefits of having these kind of applications, reminding them to have like a 10 minute break after sitting like for hours after co up, uh, behind the computer screen and uh, I, uh, or these uh, cool applications like Headspace. So I, I, I really believe that they can help. But in the end, if you look at team building, um, it's very important to just acknowledge people, to see people, to talk to people, check in with people. And how you do it, I think it depends on your culture of your company and your, your own values and, and the ethics that, that are surrounding your company and how you have formed it and what kind of people you are. And it's up to you, I think, to also feel them and see them, what they need. And sometimes it can be that simple and analog, as you said, uh, even for tech companies. We've got some good audience interaction here, uh, and I'd love to throw something into the debate that I'm afraid none of you have prepared for. So apologies, but I think it is, it is relevant. And if you look at the data in the survey, um, it certainly tallies. We, we know that there is plenty of investment still in operations. Joe, you talked about the fact that that can still be innovative. Um, but we, can, we had a comment that's come in along the lines of sustainability, literally talking about it being a hot issue at the moment. Um, Mid-November and the days are warm. I can attest to that when we did the introductory video earlier today. I'm, I'm only wearing a, a very thin jumper and it, it certainly wasn't cold. Um, less than 5% of global emissions, or more, sorry, 5% of global emissions are data centers. Another 5% come from IT equipment usage. The question is, what role do IT leaders have to contribute towards a corporate ESG net zero goal? Um, sorry to pick on you, Joe. I suppose we, we kind of talked a little bit about operations before. Uh, THG are a large organization. I'm sure that ESG is something that you have spoken about at length. Yeah, massively. Uh, gosh, in so many ways, tech leaders can contribute to this. You, you've obviously touched on data centers. Power, you know, that's the big thing when it comes to data centers and calling. Uh, what are the, um, what's all the new technology that's coming out? You know, water cooled servers, all that type of thing. We have a large data center footprint and, and we are very much um, ahead of the game looking at uh, innovation in the data center space. But it's everything as well from, you know, we, we've invested heavily at our business when in um, sort of eco businesses. Uh, we bought more trees, we bought a number of plastic recycling businesses and giving um, the option to our customers through all of our websites, not just that THG's customers for our brands, but all of our clients as well, um, to give all of our customers the option to be able to recycle any plastic, not just for stuff they bought from us, but, but for anything is really important and building that into our products and our platform and making sure that's available to all of our clients. Um, so yeah, there, there's there's so many different ways in which we can contribute to the to the ESG uh, strategy in our businesses. To throw it to to the rest of the panel, who else has felt su fully supported? Yeah, De Devi, I can see you uh, keen to come in. Yes, because I think that the, the ES ESG uh, is 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 a uh, like a company wide. Um, responsibility. It's something that the board should do and should something that be in business. And in the end, technology is always driven by business uh, projects and, and, uh, and by business goals. And so in everything that you do today, especially in Western European countries and the Americas, where we are still the largest um, uh, uh, players in, in having these emissions, everything has to be in the scale. And I think it's very important for people that are in tech to make that um, uh, decision when you build something to try to make it as efficient and uh, as less energy consuming as possible, but to also look for ways to even like reduce it to the absolute minimum. And um, I don't know whether you're uh, all co uh, familiar with the concept of degrowth, but we all know that even if we would change all the emissions that we have today in the world that are uh, like fossil emissions to uh, like green uh, emissions, then still the the we would not succeed in in reaching those those climate goals because 
the, the horror that we're causing by extracting all these minerals from the earth and soiling uh, our rivers and everything won't, won't help either. So besides actually really rethinking how we're doing business and rethinking how we are developing technology and trying to make it as energy efficient as possible, we also have to rethink how uh, we do business and, and do business models or, or, or make business models. And I think still I, with, with your report and, and of course to have this, this, this forum, it's something that um, we, we really need to like put all these brains together and start thinking about those aspects as well with regards to uh, yes, uh, reaching those sustainability goals and indeed having a, a planet that we hopefully can live uh, on beyond 2050. And I'm talking for myself, but also for my, uh, my children and hopefully their future children. Of course. Uh, Alexander, I can see that you're keen to jump in. Uh, yeah, I wanted to highlight that the carbon footprint is not only about the companies who are producing this carbon footprint. It's firstly, uh, about the consumers who consume products that uh, produce this carbon footprint. And the services or products that you support, uh, it's really much depends uh, depends on the uh, on these factors. Like a really great example uh, is a recent Ethereum uh, transition. Uh, to a different blockchain uh, algorithms. Uh, this small change in the technology uh, reduced the global electricity consumption by 0.2%, uh, if I'm not, not wrong. So, uh, for example, if you would support products that are more ecologically friendly, uh, it will have much, much bigger impact on the ecology than uh, uh, an than uh, one organization that will uh, re reduce the car carbon footprint. One topic I'm really keen to talk about is uh, diversity, and in particular gender diversity. The report states that whilst the pace of change is slow, there are record levels of female participation in the technology sector. Um, I suppose the first question would be, what's working if that's the case? What are we doing well? What do we need to do more of? And Tom, if I could come to you, I'd, I'd rather come to an ally first to make this too obvious and, and go to, to one of our three female panelists initially. Yeah, I'm going to respond to you right away, but I just first wanted to comment on the ESG part. Uh, first, I think there is a lot of uh, emphasis on the uh, environmental part of ESG, but let's not forget, and then I will jump and uh, make the bridge to the next topic on diversity. There is the S part there as well. Huh? So it's the social part there as well. And I think sustainability is also built because we, um, we bring more people to work. Uh, not only uh, not only the the ones that have work, but also support other people that don't have work. And uh, and I think that's one of the like David said, we need to build ESG in our, into our strategies. And what SD Works did is we are trying to to help our our customers to bring more minority groups into their labor force. And, uh, and I think it's important that we help to, 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 to visualize at least and to give them insight into which minority groups they might not have and which diversity they, have, they don't have into, into their talent base. And then coming back to your, to your question on diversity, um, I think um, it's not only about gender diversity. It's also, it's, it's of course about gender diversity, but not only about gender diversity. G diversity brings talent into our labor force. Everybody knows that. So stimulating that diversity more and more and more is something that we do internally within our own company, but we also help our employers to, to visualize where, in which part of the talent base they are not tapping into right now yet. Now, specifically for technology, what works and what doesn't work, it's a hard one because there we are, of course, also talking a lot about gender diversity. And I, I tend to still stick to role models. I think role models help the most still. Um, just like the report said, um, we are getting better huh, in getting more women into tech jobs, but um, it's not going fast enough. And, um, and certainly when you look at, uh, at the jobs with more responsibility in tech jobs, it's, it's really going slow. Um, so I think what helps the most is getting more women into role model management jobs uh, into, our, in the, into our tech environments. Um, I'm trying, 
at least uh, with a, with a couple of uh, of uh, my uh, uh, my leaders being in it being women. Um, and I think that will be the most helpful in the near future. What does that role model look like? Uh, Devi, I asked you to write an article along these lines in the summer. Um, couldn't agree more with Tom that role models are, are important, but what is a role model to someone who is 25 and an engineer is very different from a role model to someone who is 14 and studying science at school. What do you think we need? Well, it's uh, something that I indeed uh, do talk about a lot. And I think that's the, the difference between like uh, role models for women and role models for men is that I always say men have uh, role models in, uh, in every sport and every division so that they can actually see themselves climb up. You know, you can have like uh, the, the, the local soccer team, but you also have like the, the major league and then you go up. And so indeed with role models for, with, uh, with women in tech, it's, it's sometimes still a, a large gap to bridge. And uh, you have already like a lot of uh, awesome, awesome women, but then they're immediately like the, the super league, like Grace Hopper and, uh, and uh, yeah, the Margaret Hamilton that, uh, that invented COBOL and stuff like that. So, you know, the, it's important that, that uh, more women that are in tech speak up in Belgium. We do a lot of uh, efforts to uh, have uh, the Inspiring 50, which I've, I'm one of the uh, the members. I, we also have the um, uh, the She Goes ICT awards uh, due to and to make um, like women in tech more more visible. Um, and it's important that then you can see we also have young women uh, that we put on the spotlight so that women from 25 can identify with other women of 25 and then uh, women that uh, are higher up the hierarchy chain can also like identify with more senior women. And uh, recently there was like even a, a child book by uh, Karen Hellemans who it's uh, called uh, uh, so, uh, um, once upon a time, there was a, a brave little girl and where 50 role models uh, in, the, in the Belgian uh, scene were, were uh, written in like children's stories, uh, also to inspire like young children, because it's indeed, as Tom says, it's a problem uh, like chicken or egg. Of course, you don't have a lot of women in senior position in tech. Where would they come from? Because the women that are now in, in the age of senior positions come from the were born in the 80s. And I'm so sorry, but in 1979, uh, when I had to go and, and go study uh, engineering and stuff like that, environment was not fra female friendly. In fact, it was very harsh and very sexistic. And it's actually has not changed a lot since then. So I think when we want more women in tech today, we have to get them actually at uh, at when they come from school and try to like how you say reschool them in our companies. When we want more women in tech in the future, we have to get them in school and make sure that. And I uh, do advocate for everybody listening in into this conversation. Go and and go talk into schools about how cool STEM is and what you can achieve with it, and and make sure that you go and and inspire young girls and also boys about what you can mm -hmm. can achieve and how many different jobs there are and for what uh, it's worth for this this uh, the the acute problem at this point i think a lot of companies still can do a lot for uh, retaining women in their companies. I have had um, companies calling me to ask like how do, how it come that all our women run away from our company and then I had to actually like go and explain that if your working environment is very male oriented and it's still especially with like real tech, star, uh, tech startups uh, where most of the times you still have a lot of, a lot of boys and, and, and men that it's that that the environment is just not um, yeah um, inclusive enough, and I really mean like that that what is displayed, how the the um, the culture feels is not uh, inclusive, and therefore I do still believe that we need to talk about um, like women uh, in in the in the workforce, and then of course of in the in the broader sense of diversity, because the how how and I'm going to like say it bluntly. Um, uh, how many, uh, I say, uh, um, like uh, toilets, for instance, in, in like real tech companies, for instance, have um, um, menstrual uh, uh, things on the, on the counter? None, because it's something that men don't think about. And it's something that you bring, have to bring in from women. 
And I do believe that if you have that kind of com uh, parity in those companies, it will definitely increase uh, the amount of women that you can attract and retain and then let grow into your company. Just to jump in, we're down to the final five minutes of the debate, so I'm afraid that, that um, time is running short. But one of the comments that came through from the audience in the current environment of IT skill shortages, shortages rather, what are the job prospects of senior female IT leaders? Joe, it would be obvious to ask you this, given your, your role and your position in the industry. Normally, I'd ask Bev, who is obviously a very well thought of uh, CEO, former technologist, uh, often comes top in, in these rankings. Fortunately, she's not mic'd up right now. Uh, <laughs> um, but look, I'd love to know what your thoughts are on that, especially given that Devi was obviously touching on, on uh, women in the boardroom. In the report, hopefully I'm not misquoting this, I think still stands that at only 14%. Yeah, this is really, God, it's such an interesting topic. Um, there's definitely an issue with retention of females in the industry. And I think some of it goes back, I think Debbie just touched on this, that there are so many facets of diversity. We're talking about gender, gender is one of them. It doesn't matter which facet you talk about. If you haven't got an inclusive culture, you cannot maintain diversity. So that inclusive culture is absolutely uh, critical. Um, because what's happening is we're doing quite a good job at attracting females into the industry. Um, we're not, I think we need to be better at looking in different places for them. We talk about STEM a lot. We, we, we need to talk about other options of early careers and different ways in different routes into the industry, apprenticeships and things like that as well. Um, industry switches and changes and return to workers and ex-forces and all of those sorts of things. There's so many places we can go look for talent. Um, so we're doing quite well at attracting it in, but we're losing it. So we're about in the middle of somebody's career, sort of mid-management. Um, females leave our industry. They're not leaving work. They might take a break from work and they go back to a different industry. And that's really, really telling. And I think some of it goes back to what Debbie touched on about it can be quite an aggressive sort of male dominant um, environment. We know that it's it's an always on industry. It's a 24 seven job um, for sure. But I don't think we talk about enough of the other benefits, the flexibility, the fact it's the best industry on the planet to work in because you can change the world. You can do anything you want to do. You can take something that's a massive passion um, and apply technology to that because every business is a tech business. And I think we need to shine those positive, you know, the light on those positive messages about the tech industry to retain talent beyond mid-management. So we see more of um, more females at the big table in the boardroom and representing our, our businesses. Look, that is pretty much our hour. And I'm going to ask Bev to join me just to close the session out. But first of all, thank you to the five of you for joining us and being part of our panel today and offering such rich insights. So thank you very much for your time. Um, Bev, the report talks about the fact that successful leaders are the real, they know the real focus rather is diversity, data and innovation. Hopefully that came through in the questions in our panel today. Um, what, what do you think, reflecting on what you've heard today? Regarding diversity? Regarding any of those any topics. Of those. Take well, your look, pick. I'm going to say we started out by talking about disruption being one of the core factors and, and we've heard actually how our panellists and their businesses have actually responded to those disruptive factors and they come in many guises as we've heard. I think the agility, those organisations are agile and can adapt quickly are the winners in all of this and will continue to be so because we're in a disruptive world. In fact, let's face it, this afternoon some of you have had some challenges uh, reaching and hearing some of our video segments. So um, to make sure that we don't uh, lose out on giving you that information, by tomorrow you will be emailed uh, the full event uh, with the videos and everything in it, as well as a copy of the report. So thank you for bearing with us this afternoon. Um, I've been fascinated by what we've heard. Uh, I, I really love this industry too. I'm passionate about it, as I'm, I'm sure you know. <laughs> um, and what we would like to say as well is, please, before you log off, 
As you come out of Zoom, there'll be three questions we'd like to ask you. Feedback is everything to us. We really do respond to it. So please just take a few moments to complete those. And Dave, thank you so much. Thank you.